Today I'm going to be talking about, uh, good morning everyone, uh, today I'll be talking about archaeology, art and coastal change, which is a European project with the partners CNRS, uh, Del Torres and the University of Ghent. Um, uh, I don't think CNRS are here, and the guys of Marie van Dier, but uh, a project that we was finished uh, last year, uh, and it was after about 20 years of working in uh, coastal um, maritime archaeology, working with the community as we've tried to in the past, and I must admit we've had a few frustrations. I think what we're seeing today is much more positive. Um, I think that looking at heritage for its own sake is something that's been a bit of a no-go from the British or the English uh, government for many years. Um, it's just not relevant because there's no statutory regulations to support it, as it has already been mentioned. I should have just mentioned Lauren Tibri as she's been raised, who's uh, the co-author, who's very much involved in the project throughout the period. But unfortunately, as is the way with maritime or archaeology, you go from one project to another. Um, and now she's uh, uh, left us and gone to work with Citizen. Um, so all the best there. And I think she'll take a lot of these skills with her to make that a wonderful project. But archaeology, art and coastal change. I say it really evolved out of the need to do some recording of coastal archaeology, but recognizing that we couldn't get the funding for its own sake. So we've had to look at archaeology, not just for its own, um, to study the heritage, to learn more about the heritage, but to see how we can apply it, how we can apply it to coastal engineering, because there's a lot more money in coastal engineering, let's say, and resources uh, to understand how the coast is sort of changing and moving away. And it's something that we were doing, <coughs> working with coastal engineers back in sort of 1997-2000. And we generally had been developing these ideas of demonstrating how archaeology and in this case art uh, and historical maps and charts can be used to help us understand long-term coastal change and it's because of that we've managed to get funding for this particular uh, project so what i'll be doing today is just running through the project and showing you how we've used these different disciplines across the borders in europe it's a common european project uh, or northwest europe how we've used these uh uh, uh, tools to try and demonstrate to local authorities um, and managers that archaeology and heritage is a very useful tool. Uh, so to begin with, you have here the, the overall aim, uh, which you can read on the screen, but it really came out of the fact that we have this resource that's really underexploited, underused, and can be of benefit to coastal managers uh, for them to really help understand long-term change going back from sort of prehistoric eight, 10,000 years ago to try and establish patterns of change through time, patterns of climate change. And then more recent heritage, when we're looking at sort of photographs, also artwork, so you can actually see some tangible changes over the past um, maybe decades or hundreds of years. And I must admit, we're banging on about the value of heritage to inform change uh, for many years, and it's gone fairly much on deaf ears, but as soon as we introduced art, people started to say, oh, I understand art, therefore we'll buy into that. And it's quite interesting, it's a big sort of marketing game, to you have the real, the information is in the archaeology, but the art is a very useful tool to help uh, portray that to a much broader public. So, <clears throat> the project itself, as European projects are, are broken down into activities or work packages, um, and the first activity was looking at archaeology, the paleo environment, and coastal heritage features to demonstrate coastal change. So this is more of a long-term issue to see how the land has changed in response to sea level rise or the climate over the years. And this is just a few examples around the coast that we looked at, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, but I think if you look at the uh, look at these sort of dots here, these this is part of a a database that we set up, a GIS, a spatial database that we set up, uh, looking at the areas and showing, depending on the, the magnitude or the size of the circle or the stars or whatever tool we used, is that the amount of information that's relevant for people to access and learn about the past. I'll come back, back to that in a second. So what we had to do when looking at um, the heritage is to introduce some form of scoring parameters, because especially when you're working with engineers, you have to quantify everything. Um, as archaeologists, we tend to qualify the heritage, the value of it, and the significance of it based on our own, uh, I suppose, intellectual ability, and then we try and portray that. 
uh, when you're working with well, say, engineers and coastal managers and the like, you really need to have some form of uh, measurement that you can quantify the amount, uh, uh, <coughs> quantify the value of a particular uh, object because you know they won't know, they won't be able to make that intellectual dis the decision about um, uh, the value of an architectural site. And we had to do that in terms of we've got sea level change, environmental change, temporal continuity, and also an understanding whether this site was next to or near the coast. So when we're looking at an archaeological site to show the value of the sea level change, and these scores would be sort of one to three, they'd be rated, and then the scores would be combined. We would look at uh, how that can actually help us understand sea level change. You can look at maybe a sultan, uh, uh, which was in Roman period, it was just at uh, in the intertidal zone. Now it might be underwater or it might be elevated. But that'll give you a strong indication through time of how the sea level has changed at that point. Environmental change. This is something that we can look at how the changes, mainly things like peat deposits, which we've heard about today. You can look at peat deposits. You can have, through that, you can have a series of different environmental changes, obviously, from where they went from sort of colder period, seven, eight thousand years ago, uh, to sort of warming. And you can see how the climate is varied, how there's response within the environment, and then you can look around at the region to see how that's maybe impacted on the land. And there's temporal continuity, which is another significant factor. Do you have a record that will last for a long period of time? We talked about peat deposits. That can be something that can cover sort of hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, if you do have something like a, a salt and a salt, uh, a, a salt making site in the intertidal zone, that may be limited to uh, you know, tens or a hundred years or some such. So there's a range of important significance associated with these different parameters. So we looked at archaeological sites. Uh, we conducted field work. We did a, a search, say, of all sites along the coastline that we were, we were aware of. And then to actually focus in on a few, we did some field work in the different countries to try and get some new information about these sites to really demonstrate the value of these criteria. Um, one in the in England, it was uh, in the South England, was um, uh, the Western Solent, where there's a whole series of peat deposits and archaeological sites going back sort of 8,000 years. And so we looked at this site in the uh, Western Solent in Boldman Cliff, and you can find archaeological occupation 8,000 years ago. Um, the sea came in, flooded the site, and what we have, this is the site on the seabed in 11 meters of water, just down here. Um, we can look at the, the sea came in, flooded the site and covered it in sediment. So we can look at that old land surface. We can look at the the response of humans to the sea coming in. They were there. They obviously moved away and they left their uh, remains there. The whole area was covered with sediments, uh, which sort of indicated the rate and the scale of change in the past. And then there were certain, uh, say, the occasional hiatus. If I can get this. Up here, we had sort of new peat deposits growing where sea level might have dropped. So we have a record of long-term, about long-term sort of coastal change, uh, how the sea level has risen over a site. We can understand the environment within the peat deposit. We can see how the land has changed, how the environment has changed uh, uh, in response to that climate, and also how people have moved. Another site in the south coast, uh, south of the UK, was Langston Harbour. This is a harbour now, but of course it used to be, um, <clears throat> it used to be just sort of abraded river systems going back to the Mesolithic period, a bit sort of six, seven thousand years ago. We had these sort of river systems running through with a vegetated landscape. Um, looking at the environmental material, we can sort of reconstruct that. And then we can look at the changes from the Mesolithic through into the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, where there's also a lot of archaeological material. So we can build a picture of change in that environment and show the pattern of change through time and bring us to where we are today. And that this is an area where there's an ongoing constant erosion. So we can try and understand uh, how the landscape was formed, how it's sort of eroding away, why it's eroding away, and therefore what those threats are to <clears throat> the archeology, span but also to the coastal zone itself. And within this long-term understanding, you can start to see patterns emerging. And as the patterns emerge, you can start to sort of extrapolate those into the future and predict what sort of cycles of change you can anticipate seeing. Uh, we did introduce a whole bunch of new methodologies which could be applied 
in areas like Langston Harbour and overseas as well. But uh, these are systems that could be applied anywhere, but new ones. Um, there was a, in Langston Harbour, working with the University of Ghent, uh, they deployed a parametric seismic survey, very high resolution, uh, to try and look at the harbour itself, look through the sediments to understand where the old channels were, uh, the ones that have since been filled in and flood in, flooded, uh, <coughs> and how those changes have happened through time. And then we back that up, of course, with um, people going out in the field and getting dirty and getting core sampling to um, to sort of qualify this sort of uh, geophysical information. I don't know if you're f familiar with geophysical information, but you, you do see in this slide here, <clears throat> that's the surface of the seabed. It's looking down through the seabed, but what you can pick out here, just down here, is an old channel that used to be there, which we can get that information for reconstructing the landscape. That's since been filled in. The channel changed because of environmental pre climatic processes uh, over the past sort of four or five thousand years. That's actually now a weak spot. The sediments are quite light, and it's probably an area that's going to be more prone to flooding and degradation. Working with our partners in France, looking at archaeological sites. Um, this one here in Quiberon, uh, Begaville, a uh, wonderful site on the coastline. It, it's a, um, a big shell midden site with lots of Mesolithic archaeology, about 8,000 years old. But it shows how people were living, exploiting the coastline, and how far away they were from the coastline at the time. So we can use this to gauge how quickly that particular coastline has retreated, how people worked with and exploited the coastline at the time all part of that sort of long-term understanding of adaptation, human ad adaptation to change and how the coastline has changed. I mentioned that art was very important before because that gives a tool that you can actually show, you can, you can demonstrate to um, the, the, the uh, responsible authorities. And that quite often the story of human occupation does the same sort of thing. You have to demonstrate that humans were there, they were affected by this in the past, it's nothing new. We will have to work with it in the future. Uh, get other tools again. We looked at some uh, other sort of submerged underwater seismic uh, equipment um, because, of course, sea level has ridden, risen uh, quite a lot over the last well, 120 meters over the last 20,000 years, and in the order of sort of 10, 11, 12 meters over the last 8,000 years. So quite often we do have to look underwater to get that sort of earlier record of what happened uh, going back a few thousand years. So off Kiberon, uh conducted some uh, underwater acoustic multi-beam surveys to try and map areas of the seabed to give that sort of continuity between the underwater landscape uh, and <clears throat> underwater landscape and moving on land as well. And this is a, a couple of uh, colleagues from uh, Adramar in France uh, deploying uh, the towfish to survey the seabed. Uh, other areas we looked at. Um, in the Netherlands and also in Belgium were the polders and the Skelt polder, polder here in particular uh, is very interesting because these are sites that have been manipulated by humans over the last couple of thousand years uh, and as a consequence uh, because of sort of harvesting peat, draining the water, there's been a lot of subsidence in the land surface so there's a whole landscape that's been artificially um, say, compromised by human activity. And it's getting a record of that activity, showing, I suppose, from the wisdom of hindsight, uh, how our actions in the past have had this impact on the landscape. And now, of course, in the Netherlands and Belgium, there's a big need to put up these massive uh, sea defences to protect land that otherwise would probably have been quite stable if these impacts hadn't been put in place in the first time. And here we're using other tools, uh, um, uh, looking at sort of a uh, cone pentrometers looking down at the sediments, getting sort of core samples. To, again, try and look at those sediments. Uh, the sediments are beneath the surface, which you can see at the bottom. <coughs> so ancient gullies and sort of uh, interpretation of that underlying deposit to try and work out that sequence of events that's brought us to the place we are today and the reasons why. Looking at other strong examples in Riverside. Uh, which is in Belgium on the beach there. This is an area where the sea wall, you can see on the right, right hand side here, this big <coughs> dike has been established. The sea wall at the back of the beach, 
but quite clearly, looking at the medieval period, you can see people were living uh, on that beach. There were houses there, and it was occupied. Uh, and going back to the Roman period, there's areas there, there's peat extraction that was uh, practiced by the Romans. All this sort of material now is sort of offshore being eroded away. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the practices there is to, uh, to uh, look at the site and survey uh, and record it using different sort of seismic techniques because this peat that you see now on the image is all uh, under the sand and about two meters of sand because some groins have been put in place. <clears throat> Going to France, other areas we looked at were the fish traps and these are great examples of say monuments that were built in specific locations relative to the sea level at the time. And so looking and recording and excavating the, sea, the, the, the fish traps, it was a tool to go back and see how these changed, those fish traps have changed and adapted through time in response, I suppose, one thing, human ingenuity, but also in response to maybe changes in relative sea level or changes within the estuarine system. Uh, and I think Marira came across uh, underlying these sort of stone fish traps, different sequences of tra traps you see here, but uh, through the excavation right underneath it, there was a, a wooden fish trap which goes back to about the seventh century, doesn't it? So a lot of structures, quite a long continual record of adaptation to the sea and direct relation to the sea uh, mapping, uh, uh, mapping the changes through time. And the fish weirs, they're not just in the intertidal zone, there are a bunch of them which are now totally underwater and you, working with Adramar there was another sort of survey offshore in Brittany to try and map some of these, the, the depth and the position of these submerged uh, uh, fish traps, stone ones and try and relate the data of them to the sort of sea level at that time. Uh, just going through quickly to the other activities. Second activity was looking at art. So we looked around, uh, Bath Archaeology, looked around looking at art, portrayals of paintings around the coastline historically to see, and uh, looking at the criteria to see how useful these particular pieces of art, these artworks were. So we looked at the accuracy of artistic style, whether it was a cartoon or whether it was really trying to, an accurate depiction. Um, whether uh, what sort of medium was most appropriate, whether it was sort of a, 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 a ink, a canvas, or whether watercolors, etc. Uh, the value of the subject matter, of course, to quantify it, you know, it's much more relevant if it's something on the coastline as opposed to off the coastline um, in general terms. And also the time period, certain time periods and certain schools of art, particularly uh, painted in a very accurate way or more of a sort of conceptual way. So it's identifying what artistic, what paintings were valuable that can be used by coastal managers for understanding change. And just a sort of range of examples here, you can see how the art has been used quite dramatically, looking at some wonderful uh, churches and coastlines like Culver Church here in Kent. Um, <clears throat> there was once, uh, now it's slightly in hand, but in modern times now, the whole thing has been sort of eroded away and it's falling into the sea. So these sort of images can be quite powerful. Sometimes they're not as accurate as the archaeology, but they can be quite powerful to send the message. Looked at maps and charts, another very useful tool, again, more the historical record than pushing too far back in time. But you can look at changes in the landscape um, and, and changes, particularly <laughs> changes in the changes in the landscape to sort of monitor that sort of coastal erosion or, 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 or adaptation to the coastline. But we tried to approach this uh, scientifically and we looked at various tools to monitor any distortion and how accurate certain maps were through periods of time. Uh, and there's quite interesting work with the Schelt estuary uh, where we can actually use the maps, sort of recalibrate them, uh, look at them to make sure they're sort of as, as accurate as possible to understand how it has changed and adapted. And this sort of long-term adaptation is very useful, say, to coastal managers because they can see whether it's a natural event or whether it's actually down to human activity itself. And do the same in uh, France and look at some long-term maps and records uh, in Brittany. We can see how certain embayments have silted up, etc., on the past, again, giving us that sort of more longer-term record of change. We did the same with photographs, much more recent record, of course. Um, we looked at scoring the photographs for certain characteristics, say coastal view, heritage view, the purpose of the photograph, whether it was sort of 
a postcard, an artistic photograph, or just to sort of record it. And some of these, again, images can be very sort of powerful at understanding change. And there's some, this is an area that were concentrated by colleagues in Rennes University, uh, and they catalogued <coughs> a range of numbers of uh, postcards and uh, images here to really demonstrate that coastal change. And you see in the bottom here, sort of, if anything, the buildup of marsh. So it's not all about coastal erosion, different processes, sedimentation, etc., can happen in the same place. So it's getting that record of change. And ultimately, we're looking at combining all these resources where we can to give the sort of most powerful uh, insight into change. And this particular one here, looking at some historical records, images, but at the bottom right hand corner here, you will see uh, this is Deal Castle in Kent, which is just here. And just going back to 1872, you see the coastline was there, and we can actually monitor how much that coastline has receded. At the moment, of course, it's defended, but we can then identify areas of the coast which are on ongoing or for, for ongoing uh, attrition, let's say, and degradation <coughs> and uh, suffering erosion in the long term. So you can focus attention on those areas that do need uh, the resources that are under most threat. Another example of combined resources here, this is using the archaeology. Um, <coughs> this is a Neolithic passage, grave, see in Brittany, a wonderful example, very tangible, of something that was, of course, uh, on land, but is now very much in the intertidal zone. And you can combine it with the other sort of charts to help build a, a stronger picture of that. And there's sort of a series of other um, uh, examples. And what I do have is a whole bunch of reports here, which people are welcome to take away with them, uh, where you can read through and see all those examples as they're portrayed in the final report. So at the end of this, um, we have produced a technical report Ta -da. Uh, as a technical report and guide. We've also got about uh, 870 pages online. Um, and the website, of course, is Archmonch. I don't think I will have one here. Uh, in there. We started to produce sort of 2D and 3D models. So we've taken all the information and we've taken things like the flooding of Langston Harbour, etc. And we've turned that into 3D models on the website that you can actually see how this change has happened through time to try and make it as accessible as possible to the public as well as to coastal managers. And we've got a, a, a portal which has which is been in the background for many of the slides which you can access and you can click on this database uh, and get information and the scoring from every particular site that we've done work on or we've done a database assessment in Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and in southern England. And of course, throughout the project, there's been an ongoing um, issue of dissemination, uh, the conferences, talks, etc., and newsletters to as many people that we can engage with. I will say, um, just sort of come to a uh, conclusion, that this was uh, what we saw as a stepping stone. It was well received um, by Europe, and it's been well received by coastal managers. But there is an issue, I'd say, this guidance to coastal managers to use these resources. There's a bit of an issue there that they don't have to. It's not mandatory. So they look at it and say, that's very nice. We all agree with it. However, I've got other things to do that I have to do. And we recently did uh, apply for another sort of continual uh, European grant to take it forward to have much more community engagement along the coastline, really taking this out to the people in the same way that we've been talking about today. And I must admit, that particular one, uh, failed, and one of the reasons was they didn't see that there was a mandatory requirement for the results. So, from the EU perspective, they said, well, you know, do, does everyone really need it? Where in legislation does it say this work has to be done? And it wasn't. So, they said, you know, that's very nice, but you know, we're going to concentrate and support areas of tourism or strategic initiatives uh, which are driven by sort of um, central government or, or local governments. But I think that where we're going today, and I think with the new protocol that's being proposed, does seem very positive and it's going in the right direction. And I would like to see uh, maritime archaeology or the coastal heritage being looked after for its own sake, rather than just having to be used as a tool to understand change for other people. And maybe, you know, we're at that point now. So thank you very much.